It's Professor Adam. Let's talk about quantum mechanics, the Bohr atomic model, and the Schrodinger equation. Since we're going to talk about some quantum theory, it makes sense to look at that time when they all had that great conference together. We'll talk about some of their contributions, specifically these people, Erwin Schrodinger, Werner Heisenberg, Louis de Broglie, Max Born, and Niels Bohr. Um, so around the time people discovered the periodic table, parallel discoveries showed that elements emitted light of specific energies when they were excited by electric discharge or heat, much like this lamp. These lines were so regular that Balmer was able to create an equation to describe their energy. N is the principal quantum number and RH is the Rieberg constant for hydrogen. These quantum numbers are a big topic that we will discuss in a future video and I'll make sure to put the link in the description below. Remember that we can relate the energy of these lines to their frequency using Planck's equation. The energy is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency. Expanding on the findings of Balmer, in the Bohr model of the atom, the energies of the light emitted or absorbed can be determined from the following equation, with the energy equal to r times 1 over the lower principal quantum number squared minus 1 over the higher quantum number squared. Here r takes on this meaning with many of the symbols having their normal meaning, such as pi being pi, mu being the reduced mass, z is the charge, e is the charge of an electron, 4 times pi times epsilon 0 is the relative permittivity of a vacuum, and h is just Planck's constant. Unfortunately, this model, the Bohr model, only works for one electron systems, such as hydrogen and hydrogen-like systems. To account for these discrepancies, de Broglie determined that electrons must have particle and wave properties because of their very small mass. All objects have a wavelength. For large objects, like this whale, the wavelength is negligible, so it can be ignored. But for an electron, which is tiny and has a very small mass, we cannot ignore its wave nature. This means that electrons must always be considered as both particles and waves if we are to truly understand their properties. Electrons are standing waves. However, they are not linear standing waves like a guitar string, rather they are circular with a fixed number of wavelengths. We can then make a connection to the fact that each electron has a quantized energy because each standing wave has a fixed wavelength. As we increase the number of wavelengths, we also increase the energy of the electron. We can now see how the Bohr atomic model of hydrogen emerges. Each energy level exists because each electron can only have an integer number of wavelengths, which causes the gap in the energy levels. Wave particle duality led to the fundamental electron concept of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that stipulates that we cannot know both the location and momentum of an electron with absolute certainty. There are a number of requirements for the wave function to be physically realistic. For any given wave function, there can only be one value, as there cannot be two probabilities for an electron to exist at a particular point in space. The wave function must be continuous, that is, the wave function cannot be broken in space, as the electron can exist over all space. Because atoms have a finite size, as the distance from the nucleus increases, the probability of finding an electron must decrease. The probability of finding an electron over all space must be 1, that is, it must exist somewhere. And finally, the wave function of two different orbitals in an atom must be orthogonal to each other. That means they cannot exist in the exact same position. Based on this, Max Born suggested that the wave function could be interpreted as a probability amplitude, and the square of the wave function would tell us the probability of finding an electron at a particular point in space. Let's check comprehension. 